interview, maybe my favorite interview of all time, maybe in terms of streetwear information, because, you know, as per usual, um, Cav Empt is run by Toby Feltwell, Skate Thing and Shin. So it's kind of got, you know, the OGs of the OGs from the streetwear um, industry um, running this ship. And this is a really good interview um, with Noah Johnson, who kind of is basically one of the faves on here um on jiggy style he really does a lot of in-depth really great in-depth interviews he's got wide very has got you know he's he's from the school of streetwear you know he's he's about this life um that interview that i mentioned before with jason deal he's the one that kind of um led that thing as well so he knows what he's talking about he sits down with toby feltwell and there's a quote here that really kind of hit home to me that i want to read out to you guys so it's kevin your favorite streetwear brand's favorite streetwear brand let me kind of hide this again and bring back the sheet there's this quote here you guys started back in, let, let me get back up again there's a quote here that I really want to say to you guys that I think would um really, really, really kind of insightful to me. Where is this? 2011, right? Yeah, so this is a quote that I thought was really amazing, right? Here we go. Ba, 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 ba. So um, you guys started back in 2011, but there was a moment when you looked at um what you were doing. But uh, was there a moment when you looked at what you were doing and said, holy shit, this is bigger than what we thought it would be? And Toby answers, it's not like some kind of sudden um, dawning. Um, there's an accumulation of feedback and we've all been involved in starting brands. I've known Shin for a very long time. I reached a theory or an understanding of how brands work. It's a partnership between the people who are making the stuff, the making the brand and the audience. And what the brand eventually becomes is not wholly decided by an entirely uh, either one party. It needs a participation of both which is fucking cool. Isn't it? I never really thought about it that way, but that is, does explain a lot of what happens to brands. Like even Supreme is probably a good example of it, right? Um, it starts off, especially if you see some of the old editorials of Supreme back in the day that used to be in skate magazines and stuff. It was very much so, <coughs> it was very much so your bog, but your standard skate wear, right? The whole story goes with James Jebby that he was shopping in the store. He saw some of the skate clothing that was around on the racks and he kind of really didn't like the quality of what they were putting out, right? And he thought he could do a better job, right? Um, so it starts off purely on a skateboarding sense of a word, right? Where you want to just make a higher level of skateboard clothing because you really appreciate the culture. You think these guys are really influential. They look really cool. So you make really good basics. You start with windrunners. You start with windbreakers. You start with coach jackets, long sleeve, polo tops, t-shirts beanies uh work pants chinos socks trainers decks wheels trucks right then eventually over time through what you see the the brand being right so the making of the stuff right uh, making the brand how the brand looks like and how the audience receives and what they like and what they're really um, resonating with all of a sudden the brand kind of changed and if you remember supreme went through some really interesting waves right it went through that wave where it was a kind of a core core skate group band it went through the wave where noah babazian from noah was working there and some of the clothes that he made during that period are very much some things that you would see uh, echoed in noah an example being do you remember that supreme um jacket that had like the bars that white and blue bars like it was kind of like an uh, a sailor's jacket for the most part that's something that you don't see for the most part in noah right it's not necessarily a piece that you see now that is supreme then when no no but Bezian left and the other dude took over you're now seeing a different side of what supreme is right you're seeing that kind of you know the fire flame um the the flaming skull um you know top and bottom leather jacket leather pant thing you're seeing some of the alpine sports stuff it's kind of shifted into something else and again that's kind of uh the audience reception you've seen a lot of you know a lot of supreme written on the front of things and the back of shorts and the front of jumpers a lot of kind of icon and it kind of changed basically uh, uh, based on what the audience is kind of receiving it to and I think that's something I've never really thought about it's something very very astute um, observation from Toby and the quote continues so whenever you put something out there there's always a re reaction even if it's be if it's to be ignored but after a certain point in time you do get some understanding that there are people who are looking towards what you're doing with some level of expectation which is true in it because sometimes you do put out something it doesn't get reception that you're meant to you thought it would get you end up with, I don't know, 100 pieces of a T-shirt that no one really wants. And then you, what, what what happens if you're a smart person and you're an idiot? You realize, oh, actually, no one likes this. I'm not going to do that again, right? Or the audience aren't ready for this. I'm going to pull this one back again and maybe introduce it later in another sort of way. So there's always that kind of constant conversation happening. It's not necessarily you just putting out things and just hoping people buy it. It's always a constant conversation. I think it's really, really cool, a really astute point um, that he made. Um, and there's another... Da -da -da -da. There was another thing that he said as well about streetwear that I thought was really interesting. Uh, da, 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 fake, I think. Where is it? Many times in the past. There's something he said about streetwear that I thought was really interesting too about fashion. 
and about their obsession with streetwear. Whereas the people with proper fa- was it was fashion, where did they say? Um, happy fashion was pretty strange. I think. Yeah, there we go. So, um, this quote really was something I like. Let's go back to the top of it again. Really, the graphics are, uh, of KVM are the best, isn't it, right? Uh, so uh, you once said uh, people who are proper fashion designers who are influenced by streetwear are often looking at streetwear as an aesthetic phenomenon rather than social phenomenon right which is true they look at streetwear they just put on a suit with a pair of trainers it's like oh it's like no like look at what people are wearing in the street right look at what that dude who's gonna wear a baluti a baluti suit would wear on his feet he's running around from office to office he's living in manhattan he probably walks everywhere even though he's got the money to get cabs everywhere it's probably quicker to walk because he lives within a five block radius of everything that's in a five block radius for him he might not want to wear hard hard sole shoes all day or he might want a hard sole shoe with maybe a rubber sole right but it's not, it's not just about putting trainers on the bottom of it it's about making a suit that kind of moves better because he's running around more uh maybe making a suit that is i don't know modular maybe making a suit that has a, a, a particular component so he doesn't need to carry a suitcase or a bag maybe the shoe's different you know it's not necessarily just a a slap on thing and i think he kind of mentions it uh that leads to the idea of a partnership between the brand and its audience could you expand a little bit on the idea of social phenomenal aspect of it toby answers it's a weird thing it's ubiquitous to a degree to a degree where sometimes you see um you sometimes you see quite venerable designers who deserve some level of respect for what they've done in this career is almost debasing themselves you know what i mean you get models carrying skateboards down a catwalk like the worst kind of cyberpunk club scene and that sort of thing um, and that sort of shit like a 90s 80s movie it's just embarrassing um it's like a buy-in and i'm quite conscious that it's boring to go on about it like credentials of having been there at, at, the, at the time after all who cares which i understand but all i can say is the era that developed the brands that gave us a grounding to this world is all about authenticity it was about genuinely it was a it, it, we're generally into this shit which again is something i'm into yeah it wasn't cool just to suddenly turn up with all the right gear agree right which is something that you've you don't really see too often echoed within the younger generation now it's and again it's just very strange to me i just don't know i just don't know when this happened i i remember right this is something that's very even some people don't even remember this. i remember there was a time when i used to write for hypebeast right when it first kind of launched there was a few of us, some of the contributing editors, I was trying to convince Kevin Ma to change the name, right? We didn't like the name. Everyone hated the fucking name. Hypebeast was a horrible name. We didn't want to be caught. We didn't want to be associated with oh, what, who, what do you do? I'm a Hypebeast writer. It just didn't come across right. You just didn't sound like a dweeb, right? But then somehow along the line, you know, Kevin Ma got proven right. Hypebeast is going to become, you know, successful. Uh, me- a massive media empire with loads of other brands underneath it. Massive office in Hong Kong. And he's, you know... Uh, Rich Bernie's Wilders believes doing the thing that he loves, cool, no problem. But then for the audience, it's now become a badge of honor to call yourself a hype beast, right? To queue up in front of Supreme and just to buy everything that comes out during that drop and not care about what it looks like on you is cool. To become a, to, to be a, a, an unabashed reseller is somehow become cool. Before it was like a thing you just did in the, in the shadows to kind of uh, raise money for the thing that you actually wanted to do. You didn't want to necessarily be like a career reseller. That was a bit corny to be that person either, right? But somehow it became a cool thing. And now it also became a cool thing to turn up. You're 13 years old and all of a sudden you have every single piece of acronym, right? You've gone into Grail, you bought all the fucking archive pieces, all the new pieces, all of a sudden you're, you're ready to go. That was never the thing. Before it was like, you know, could you what could you afford from the collection? A belt, a jacket. I remember my first piece from Bathing Ape when it was, um, when it was on Upper James Street. My first item from Bathing Ape was a bit of sellotape. A roll of sellotape for 20 quid is my first piece for, that I got from Bathing Ape. 20 quid sellotape. 20 quid. That's how much I did. That's what I got from Baby Ape. My first thing. But nowadays, if you're a kid, the first thing from Baby Ape you get is probably a pair of Babesters. It's maybe a snowball jacket. It's maybe a leather jacket. Like, it's insane. It's fucking insane. The buying is, the buying level is just like too, too, too high um, for my liking in general. Um, again, not necessarily my concern, necessarily something anyone would actually give a shit about that I'm talking about. But again, something that doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, he continues um i've got quite a lot of nostalgia for that era it was a bit gangish which i like as well about it um it, like you knew who was in the gang because they were been there you couldn't just decide to be a member it took a bit of effort again i love that thing um i think those days are pretty much gone uh but it's something that people uh hunger for in a way because everything in modern society is geared towards making consumption easier these kind of associations were like you're not allowed to wear a t-shirt because you don't know what it means are a barrier to easy consumption which i kind of appealed a like because i think in general even though the slam city skates did work absolute cunts to me and you know i probably don't have any time for them now apart from a couple of them um even though i was you know again i was one of 
I was probably one of the only people from ends that used to go to that shop, right? And now they're kind of, you know, whole, wholly inviting people from, you know, um, from ends basically to kind of stand beside them and give them a, a sense of authenticity because they try to uh, replicate this image that they're from the streets. Not necessarily the Slam City skaters people, but some of the London skater crew people, right? Like, you know, wankers, a lot of them. But there are some good people in there, don't get me wrong, but, you know, that kind of attitude was annoying. But I kind of get it because essentially skateboarding is still where it is now because of that kind of closed... Um, nature of it right because of that you know it does take a there's a barrier to entry because you have to skate right you have to learn how to skate you have to learn to ollie up and down the curb right in the general just to be allowed in the conversation drop in <laughs> those kind of things right so that kind of eliminates a certain amount of people or maybe if you're not that person that skates you have to be the cool dude within the group people that want they want you to hang around they're not necessarily going to invite you to come and chill with them they won't necessarily pass the joint to you because they don't know who you are blah blah blah, blah. there are things that do that that kind of allow that high barrier of entry is something that you kind of see if reflected in places like the Bergheim or in Berlin club scene, right? They then, for the most part, when you go into these places, you're not seeing smash bottles on the floor, people are generally well behaved, blah, 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 blah. But in streetwear, that kind of has kind of gone by the way. And for the most part, everyone can kind of get what they want as long as they have the money. You can kind of get, like I mentioned the other day about being an influencer, you can kind of be an influencer if you want to. If you've got the funds to fly to different locations, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of get in the right rooms. It doesn't necessarily require you to be a cool, chill, interesting person. It just requires you to have the money to do that. Well, again, which is annoying, but, you know, it is nature of the beast. Um, it continues. Is, is that even possible now? There are certain value to it, but to try and recreate it in a world of today is a bit fake but at the same time you recognize the cringe factor with everything that ha is happening in fashion at the moment it's pretty strange i think streetwear is still being a topic in the fashion world it's like this is the most unsurprising thing in the world fashion has decided to drop some of the pretense of making clothes exclusively for events that don't really happen in real life which is true right gala the regular person isn't going to gala isn't going to a black tie event they just want clothes that's going to make them look sexy it's going to you know um it's going to make them look hot it's going to make them feel like a million bucks that's going to i don't know it's going to make them feel good about themselves they don't necessarily want to you know look at they're going to the the baftas and shit because they're never going to go to the baftas for the most part or they don't want to go right fashion has decided to stop the pretense of the um, and making stuff as crucial events that happen in real life and actually making clothes that match what they see when they have to leave the design studio, which is true, right? You're going to go on the train, you're going to go to a post office, you might go to a bank, you might go to meet your friend in a fucking dive bar. There are different types of clothes that you need in that environment and things that necessarily look the way I don't know, Roberto Carvalho makes clothes, right? They don't necessarily appeal to a certain um, segment of society. They actually see people on the street enjoying wearing occasionally pretty interesting stuff. So it's strange that streetwear being in fashion is considered to be something out of the norm still, even though it's become so ordinary. Yeah, because that's what essentially what streetwear is, right? Streetwear is this idea of taking what people are wearing on the street and elevating it somewhat, right? Giving it a little bit of a twist. A coach jacket isn't that dissimilar from what most dudes that work security or construction might wear if they're kind of freezing outside, right? Um, some combat trousers you might buy a particular brand aren't any different that you might be buying from an arm fatigue store. Um, a security jacket might not be different from what the duck bin man wears. And, yeah, I mean, it's stuff that you see people wearing every day, but you just want to elevate it somewhat to give it a little bit more of a shine. And again, this interview is really interesting. I recommend you check it out. Probably one of my favorite interviews um, of recent times. Toby Feltwell interview with GQ. You've got loads of different little pieces here you get to see as well from the collection that they have too. And again, KVM is something that is really hard to get a hold of because they have really fucking, um, 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 what do you call it? They have really ardent fans that buy fucking every Oh, you know that trouser? Oh, I thought it was power. That trouser looks a little similar to the Supreme jacket that came out the other day. Um, their fans are fucking fanatical as fuck, so they, they buy literally everything that's on the web shop. It always sells out. Even the most, you know, um, generic of items sells out very quickly, which, again, they're probably happy about. But, again, one of my favorite cult brands out there, they've got a really, really specific design aesthetic, something that you separate them from tri Something you see, like Cactus, Fl like cactus Flea, Cactus... Cactus, whatever, how you pronounce it, right? They have a specific aesthetic. There's not many of them in streetwear now that have a particular sort of taste that you can kind of tell straight away. When you see, um, you could, you don't need to read the headline. You can really see what a Kevin piece is when it's featured on Hype Beast or whatever it may be. So I recommend you check it out. Um, Kevin interview on um, GQ. It's called Kevin is your favorite streetwear brand's favorite streetwear brand. A conversation with Toby Feltwell, formerly of a bathing ape and now leading the charge at Kevin alongside Shin and Skate Thing.